And welcome back to the program. You're listening to Sacred Space here on CJUM 101.5 FM at Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. We're sitting here speaking with Oriah Mountain Dreamer. This is a, a huge honor for us to, to have. As, as uh, listeners know, we've uh, read the invitation. Uh, I couldn't even name the amount of times we've read that uh, poem over the year and shared it with others. And uh, we actually get a, a chance in person to say thank you. That's a wicked poem, for it, and thank you for sharing that with uh, with the world. Thank you. We were kind of talking a little bit before break. It mentioned the New Age, and I wanted to ask you about this. Um, what do you think about the concept or the term New Age and the philosophy that's behind it? Well, I, the first thing I would say is I think um, what people refer to as, as New Age is it's not a homogeneous kind of group or, or set of philosophies. I think it's it's a good term in the sense of it marks a, a shift that expanded, particularly in the West, beyond the organized religions that we were familiar with, into an openness towards uh, religion and spirituality and philosophies from other traditions around the world. And that has revitalized, in a sense, the spirituality in the West, even for those who have stayed within their sort of uh, religion of birth. It has uh, opened that up uh, and revitalized some of their experience of their or their own home religion of birth, and for many other people, has offered them ways of participating in uh, community and in connection to spirit that wouldn't have been available had it only been what say they were raised with. So I think, in that sense, it it truly does mark a, a new age of kind of an interweaving uh, and an openness to different traditions. The downside, as with most things, there are kind of two downsides, is that when you start to open up to a wide variety of traditions, the opportunity for things to become kind of a muddy mix gets there. So every tradition has uh, what, in the tradition I come from, a kind of alchemy of how they work with energy. Um, All of them have an alchemy that will work, but when you start to mix alchemies, it's a little like baking a cake and deciding to substitute honey for sugar, you can do that on the sweetening front, but you need to understand how that's going to work kind of alchemically for the baking of the cake, <laughs> because you're probably going to have to add more flour or something else, or the whole thing's going to be a sticky mess. Uh-huh. So that's one of the downsides, is you can sometimes have people who don't really have much knowledge of how alchemy works energetically in, say, a ceremony or a healing or something, and they're throwing things in kind of willy-nilly, and it's not, well, at best, it's not working too well. The other thing you can get, and this is because human beings will do this with pretty much anything, is you can get a, a fundamentalism. And you can get New Age fundamentalism, just like you can get Christian or Muslim or Judaic fundamentalism. You know, the human capacity to say, this is the way, the only way, and this is the rule. The rule is that you have control of everything with your thought which, of course, all the subtleties of how energy interacts, how our minds profoundly affect how we both see the world and what happens in our lives, but to go to, you know, you control everything. If you just think money, 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 money will flow in and somehow your bills will evaporate um, is a kind of dangerous and... um, and a sort of fundamentalism that, as with most fundamentalisms, doesn't serve anybody. Yeah, except uh, maybe the, the the few that are um, selling those books on well, those I things. Well, I guess, yes, I suppose. <laughs> it's working for them. I totally agree. And um, one of the other things that maybe you touched on in a, in a quiet way was uh, what O'Billy used to refer to as the weekend warriors. Uh-huh. You know, we have those type that, to, you know, do their day-to-day stuff, mm-hmm. and then on a weekend, whatever their... Um, book they're reading or program mm-hmm. they're watching this week is the new in thing. Yeah, and you know, that's been going on from long before the New Age movement. I mean, I grew up in a time where in a small town in northern Ontario where everybody went to church on Sunday. And that didn't have a whole lot to do with what they did from Monday to Saturday. So, you know, our capacity to kind of relegate our, our spiritual life to, uh, you know, an hour or a weekend, you know, a month or whatever it is, um, I, again, didn't didn't come from the New Age movement. I think that um, one of the different, you know, again, there's the plus of opening to all kinds of different traditions. 
one of the downsides is because there's so much you can learn is that you can skate from introductory level to introductory level to introductory level and call that your spiritual practice. But in fact, all you're doing is, is kind of skimming along the top. And there's a reason for that. Any spiritual tradition worth its salt, if you actually do the practice, whatever that looks like on a regular basis, is going to push you up against the wall of your own resistance on the places that you are afraid of. And the difficulty with having so much variety available is you can go to that point in a particular tradition and then go, oh, this isn't for me, (laughs) and go do another one at the introductory level. And you can do that for a lot of years. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. There's another thing that uh, that we used to call it uh, those that get too blissed out. Uh When you're so out there, and it's usually created by a very unique experience and a wonderful experience, but it just blisters one out so much that it then becomes almost harmful. Well, right. I mean, the thing about spirituality is that there are going to, like anything else, like being in love, like, you know, a million other things, there are going to be peak experiences. And heaven only knows, you know, life has enough downsides that it, it's lovely to have peak experiences. Yeah, I love peak experiences. If you are not grounded in the necessities of, of caring for yourself and for the, you know, those who are dependent upon you and um, things like that, then the problem is that you can, well, even if you are grounded in those, I think what happens is life can become a quest for the peak experience, which is really a quest to escape everyday realities yeah and the problem is you live in everyday reality it's a little like you know living for that you know less than one percent of the time um and the rest of it gets to be kind of denigrated as non-peak experience and if you're not grounded it actually can be quite dangerous i mean you don't want somebody uh driving the car who's having a peak experience and who's (laughs) ungrounded no thanks (laughs) Or, you know, in a dentist office, having somebody going off in some OOBE they had the other night, and he's right. drilling on your tooth. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're you're hoping your dentist is not having a peak experience <laughs> <laughs> <He's>... <laughs> tending to business, you yeah. know. So, yeah, there's uh, – and, and I think, of course, the – the trick here is to really carry the essence of the peak experience. Yes. The, the knowing of your connection to a larger whole, your participation in that, in some very real way throughout um, your ordinary day. Yeah. And to make places in that day that can remind you of that without having you become really ungrounded. The other reason it's dangerous, and um, there's a fellow here in Toronto who I've met recently. Uh, Jeff Brown, who's written a book called Soul Shaping. Oh, yes, yeah, we've had him on the program yeah. years ago. And yeah. he talks about, the term he uses that I like is the spiritual bypass, where people really need to do some psychological work and healing from very real wounds in their past. And, of course, the problem with doing that work is it always gets, it always hurts worse before it gets better. You've covered over an old wound, yeah. and it's kind of festering there. It's not going to be fun to uncover it and let it breathe. And, you know, initially it's going to feel worse. So who wants to go there? You know, most of us don't go there voluntarily. And the, the quest for the peak experience can, in fact, be a quest, a hope. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the hope, don't get me wrong, <laughs> <laughs> that I can just, you know, leapfrog from peak spiritual experience to peak spiritual experience and never have to deal with that wounding. It yeah. won't work. No. I'm not unsympathetic to our desire to find a way out of having to uh, deal with that wound. Peak experiences are great, but like like most things, they are just a tool to get someplace. They're not the place. Yeah. That's kind of how I look at it, but and they sure are fun. And you live there. I mean, I know people who say they live there. I've never seen anybody who I believed. And I, and I always say to people, look, the Dalai Lama says he's not enlightened. Yeah. If he's not enlightened, I'm pretty sure I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I did a Chenrezig with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. That's uh, a, a heart chakra meditation in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And I came out, oh, man, I tell you, Seattle, downtown Seattle, is not a good place to be after you've gone through a heart chakra meditation right. with the Dalai Lama. It's not fun because there's too many people walking around with a lot of pain, and when you're that open, you're able to see that. Yes. <laughs> It's not fun. Yeah. 
uh, he's an amazing guy. I just loved what uh, that. Uh, that's one. That was one of those peak experiences. I must yeah. say, <laughs> doing that with them was was pretty cool. There was actually only one thing that I kind of place over that in my life, and that was the uh, the near death experience. But mm. um, I don't um, condone going out and having a near death experience for uh, your peak experience. <laughs> <laughs> You shouldn't go out and try to create it. Exactly. No, <laughs> no it was definitely fun. But uh, um, I want to hear your thoughts and musings on uh, 2012. Oh, yeah. What are your thoughts and musings? Well, this will be short because I don't have a whole lot. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, you know, in the Mayan calendar, the end of a world uh, meant the rebirth of the next one. Um, and only our death-obsessed culture could make this about you know, the <laughs> end of the world. Yeah. Um, the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm not too worried about it. I mean, if I have any concern about it, it's a concern about what crazy things people will do uh, because of the story that they've decided they, they like about it, you know? Yeah. Certainly, you know, things like dates and time, I'm not sure to the earth makes a whole lot of difference. I guess what I would say is we have plenty to worry about here yeah. <laughs> with what's going on on the earth, um, both in the human community and our interaction with the natural community without adding another layer of, of mythology about it, you know? Yeah, totally. And I sometimes think, because you know, you could ask me the same question tomorrow and I might say something different. So that's why I say I sometimes think um, that in some ways it's actually a detriment because I, I think that it, it takes away from almost, you know, I, I, I think balance is really important so when I say the presence I don't mean it all the time but it kind of gives people a an excuse mm -hmm. not to be doing maybe what they should or could be doing mm -hmm. I don't like to use those words either should or could it should, you should do this or should do that I, I don't like that well, but, not doing but do you know what, what I mean they, you know what I mean really long to do yeah you know, they put it off to like you know 2012 and then it's put off to this other great thing that's happening in 2019 or you didn't know what I mean yeah. instead of just concentrating <laughs> on on what's Human needed now been doing this truly from the beginning of time I'm quite sure yeah exactly yeah you know I mean the early Christians after uh, the historical Jesus died were sure that his return and the rapture was coming you know in their lifetime yeah so you know when when Paul says um, you know don't uh, uh, don't marry uh, don't have you know uh, sexual relationships but if you have to get married kind of thing <laughs> he's doing that in the context of believing that any time we're about to be beamed up focus on something else the good news I suppose is that human oh, human life you know, wins out. Uh, uh, you know, all the arguments in the world about the rapture didn't stop uh, young men and women of the early Christian church from seeking out partners and having babies and all the rest of it. <laughs> so, you know, uh, it's the claiming to know something we can't know, I think, probably is the piece of the, the 2012 stuff I find irritating. Same here. That's... And our tendency, as all fundamentalism does, to literalize, to say, you know, this is this is the prophecy of the end of the world. Instead of saying, what might that mean, symbolically? Yeah. That's so important.